a uh, couple of things just before we jump into our final keynote panel. So uh, I mentioned this morning that Len Silverstone's workshop tomorrow on understanding uh, behavioral factors is going to be switched from the the here bell, the boat, into the cockatoo room. Um, uh, I may have also mentioned that we were thinking of switching lunch because of the likelihood of rain tomorrow, but looking outside right now, it's like, <laughs> let's, let's make that call tomorrow when we see how the weather actually is rather than, than maybe preventing ourselves from gathering outside again because it's such a gorgeous day. All right. Um, uh, the way to uh, learn that tomorrow, by the way, just uh, if you could check the app or the digital sign that's out there, we'll be making those updates um, as soon as the decision is made. Uh, I mentioned this morning these pink uh, forms. Um, we don't actually have enough for everybody, so uh, but you can submit these um, over the next couple of days if you're going to be around. We'll also include the evaluations from the Thursday and Friday sessions. If you include those, then we'll include you in the drawing that I mentioned for uh, either an all-expense-paid uh, return visit to DGIQ in June or uh, for one of the free tickets that we'll be giving away for Enterprise Data World in March. All right. Uh, we have something special happening right at the end of uh, this session. So um, one of our panelists, uh, Kim Winezero, Correct. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, wrote a book recently called D The Data Governance Guidebook and Playbook by a Practitioner for Practitioners. The folks at Alation um, had ordered many copies, I think 100 copies of the book <laughs> for Kim to sign. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, perhaps the Amazon outage yesterday, they did not arrive in time. So they are set up out uh, aside the room here, and if you would like a copy of Lynn's uh, book for free, uh, Kim's book, I'm sorry, for free, then um, just go there and, and scan your badge. They'll uh, capture your address, and they can they can mail that to you afterwards. Uh, so, thanks very much to the folks at Alation for doing that. Um, the if you were interested in taking the Certified Data Management Professional exams while you're here. Uh, there is one more time slot this evening, five to seven, in the Russo East West Room. That's the, the small room just around the corner from the coffee shop downstairs. Uh, there's been a number of people who've been taking those exams so far, so uh, take advantage of that opportunity while you're here. It's a, it's a um, don't pass or don't pay. So if you take the exam, don't pass, you won't pay uh, for that um, unfortunate experience. <laughs> <laughs> the pass rate is very high. Uh, well, actually, it's a very demanding exam, uh, which makes it a, a, you know, a valuable credential. But um, the pass rate amongst the folks who uh, attend these conferences is generally fairly high. Also, the um, Data Governance Professional Organization, the DGPO, uh, conducted a raffle with some, some uh, prizes as well. Uh, there were... Uh, uh, two free memberships offered. Uh, one was won by Akriti Agrawal of Emeritus uh, and the other by Michael Pip of MDTA. The DGPO will be in contact with you about uh, how to get your free membership. And there was also a $100 Amazon gift card, uh, which was won by Jesse Huerta of the uh, US Air Force. So uh, they will be in touch with you also, Jesse, about that. Okay, let's jump into our final panel then. And I wanted to leave us with the theme of adapting to the future. Uh, you know, this has come up in various contexts through the, the course of the meeting so far, but uh, let's put a little organization around it. Um, so I've asked each of our speakers here uh, each of them is a senior data management, data governance executive within their organizations. Um, Ryan Dupe is the VP and Chief Data Officer of American Fidelity Assurance. Kim Widesero is the Director of Data at Radio Systems Corporation, which I find a particularly interesting name for an organization whose main brands are PetSafe and 
Sport Dog. How did that come about? Yeah, it's... They uh, pivoted at one point. I'm having a little brand identity crisis here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Invisible will, I won't. I won't press you on camera then, so... But um, <laughs> uh, she was uh, most recently the Chief Data Officer for the state of Tennessee, too. Just uh, very recently moved over to Radio Systems. And Hayes Williams is the Head of Data Governance for the R&D Division of Daiichi Sankyo. And um, Hayes uh, gave a ter terrific presentation a little earlier today about the use of video in, in uh, communicating about data governance, which uh, we have on camera. Actually, I think we have both Kim and Hayes' uh, prior presentations. Ryan, I think you were in a different venue. But th the, the video uh, that we've been taking just of this room over the past two days will be shared with you for free, of course. So. Um, uh, you know, you'll be, you'll be able to uh, experience all of these sessions later. All right, so uh, I wanted to start out, please, by, by asking each of you to just reflect on the past couple of days. Sorry, we should have moved this podium, shouldn't we? Is there any chance, John, of just backing that out of the way so I can actually see folks? I know I'm tall, but... <laughs> um, what were the best ideas that you got from the last couple of days? Ryan, let's start with you. Can I share a few? Absolutely. Yeah, um, so I'll share a few of the highlights that I got from some sessions, and I was reflecting on this just a little bit ago. Um, on Monday, there were a couple of really good sessions that I was in. The first one was on building a successful data quality program, and that was with John Talbert. Um, I thought there were some interesting things he shared around how data quality relates to manufacturing quality and how a lot of the, the same principles cross both and he talked about the difference between data quality assurance which is those data quality processes and checks along the the manufacturing process versus data quality control which is something that happens at the end after a data product is delivered and he talked about the importance of, of having both in place um, there was a, a in the afternoon on monday there was a really good session uh, i attended on a bu building award-winning business glossaries um, and one of the key questions I was hoping was going to be answered, and it kind of did, was, is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> and the session was all about <laughs> business glossary, so the answer was, it depends. It depends on how you define a sandwich. Uh, and I did learn that the USDA would consider a hot dog a sandwich, but they wouldn't consider a grilled cheese sandwich a sandwich because it doesn't have meat in it. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, but all seriousness, it, it was a good session. If you're trying to understand the difference between a business glossary, a data dictionary, and a data catalog, there were a lot of good tips from that session. Um, I'll share just a few more. Um, I thought that the keynote this morning from Scott Peachy was, was really insightful, the engine that drives the data office. I think those are some good takeaways for everyone around what a mature data governance function may look like. I uh, also really liked his slide on what data governance is versus is not. I think there's a lot of good principles that can be taken from that. Um, another session I attended was Exercises in Data Ethics from Peter Aiken and Karen Lopez. Uh, and that session was really good. It just made me think harder about data ethics. It's not always something that's front of mind or that we think about every day, but it is something that is really healthy to be thinking about as, as you build out your data solutions. And then the last one I'll hit on was, I, I, earlier today as well, Scott Taylor's presentation. I, I think that was probably the funniest uh, presentation on data I've ever seen before, so I, I thought it was fantastic, and um, I hope there's a recording. It was in this room, so I'm assuming there is a recording Oh yeah, there's a one. recording of that one. Yeah, there were probably a couple dozen one-liners that I'd love to <laughs> add to my brain so I could use as needed. Uh, so those were some of my big takeaways from the session. Yeah, the, the one-liner from Scott that stuck with me was respect the ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, by the way, so we have a couple of uh, microphones in the audience. Um, like, you know, we don't have to wait till the very end for you to chime in if you have something else. And in fact, I'll ask, uh, once we're uh, uh, through asking this question of our three panelists, I'll ask anybody in the, the crowd who'd like to contribute to this question as well about, you know, what are the best ideas you're taking home? All right, uh, let's move from the audience left to right. Hayes, 
What were your, your best takeaways? So I will talk more about themes. I wasn't as good about talking about in specific presentations, which was excellent. Um, I, uh, a couple of themes I took, uh, one was uh, uh, metricing the uh, data governance program itself. I have to say I, I know better. It's great to come to uh, an event like this and kind of reaffirm what you know you should be doing um, and taking that back with a, a, a bit more kind of energy. And a couple of tips, tricks, and ideas for how to convey the business value to the business, uh, how to, what data governance means. Um, training, a lot of mentions of training, and uh, some good ideas from my perspective on formalizing, uh, being more deliberate about how to bring people into the data governance uh, area, what courses do you need, what uh, methods you use to train. And from uh, Scott uh, uh, Pichy's uh, uh, keynote yesterday, I did take something from that as well. I took a, you know, a, a crisis of confidence. You know, why am I not doing more? Why is it not going faster? You know, that kind of thing. So yeah. that's what I have for you. All right. Kim, what's your take? Yeah, so um, in the last session I presented, I uh, uh, called out Jim Johnson's presentation, uh, what uh, every business should know about data governance. He has got a slideshow that is just jam-packed full of intelligence. So if you haven't downloaded that, download that. Um, some aw uh, awesome checklists and insight in there. Um, the Delta Dental folks, are you in here? They've they, got it. They were the remote. They were one of the remote ones. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, they, uh, in their presentation, they have a super cool infographic. Like, without even talking to these gentlemen, I could look at the infographic and know what their journey has been since 2015. So, um, very, uh, very good for executive level support buy-in. Um, so, I really like that. I keep hearing, uh, as far as themes go, uh, that executive support, you have to have it. Um, I learned more about data fabric, uh, thanks to the IBM folks, because um, I didn't know, is that like a person, place, or thing? So I learned more about that. Um, Scott Taylor was amazing. Um, but the one thing that keeps cropping up, and I ha it hadn't really dawned on me, um, like why do we call it governance? And I know it's in our, you know, we are the governance uh, conference here, but the examples I've been hearing is like, we don't call it like HR governance, even though they're doing the same thing with people. So like the word governance keeps coming up as, boy, is there a softer word we could use for that? Is there, has there been a, a good alternative that's been proposed? I haven't, uh, I haven't heard any other than saying we're the data department. Oh, Amber's got an idea. Uh, this morning, I don't know, I think it was the CEO of Opal, and she said, we're the data defense. So that's my new thing. We're not data governance, we're data defense. <laughs> data defense, <laughs> yeah. Um, who, who has uh, some great ideas that they're taking away from this conference? Well, that's kind of disappointing that nobody would have any ideas. <laughs> Maybe I should rephrase that question. Who'd like to share some of the, the big ideas that they're taking away, or things that you're going to do differently when you get back to the office? Way in the back there. Yep. Differently, I would say with more energy. Okay. Just reconfirm, reaffirm what needed to be done. Differently, you know, but with more energy. Fair enough. One of the, one of the uh, best talks, and, and I alluded to this this morning on the panel, was um, Tim Mothergrove's talk. I think you know, his emphasis on incorporating project management metrics and techniques into the development of their program, I, I think, had some terrific insights in it. I mean, being in the room, the, the type of questions that came up, uh, that one clearly resonated with a lot of people, too, uh, as, as something to to try differently. Um, yes? Uh, 
methodologies for that. Rob Siner's, or Bob Siner's uh, presentation on communication I thought was excellent and it's, just keeps resonating in my head that, yeah, we need to do a lot more of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Carlo, if you go there, Dave, if you could uh, come over here and, and Danette has, we'll take Danette's question first or, or Danette's contribution first. So I liked the, the one on meditation mindfulness. I'm sorry, I can't remember the woman's name. Oh, Mattia? Mattia Zhao? Yeah. Uh huh. That, that was really good. And she really showed how it can help. And you can easily do that within a corporation. It was not just individual, but with, with your team. And Zen with Len on the Beach is a particular favorite. Uh, that one you can go to every conference. Every conference I go to it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my, my last mention is John Ladley did a presentation on big G, little g. So big governance, little governance, and how do you move from doing a number of projects to making it actually a, a, part, a part of the foundation of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, he, had, he had some really good ideas, and some of that was part of conversations with Gwen Thomas, who's done a lot with governance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, probably many of you, because there were, there were about 40 folks, I think, at Len's session. Um, next time you come along, try to get up a little bit early. It is a brilliant way to start the day uh, in 30 minutes. But uh, Matias' presentation was very much oriented towards you know, a, sort of enterprise application of mindfulness, which, whereas Len's is more oriented to the individual. Yeah, I thought there was value in both of those. Um, we had a quest, uh, contribution back there, yes. It was lovely and heartening to see so many hands raised when the question about a department of one was posed. <laughs> and it made me stop questioning what I was doing wrong and start thinking how I can subtly steal other colleagues and make them my pseudo team. Uh -huh. Some of the presenters have just so casually used terms like marketing communications would partner with that. And I thought, we have a marketing team and I've never asked if they would market this for me, but they have 23 people and I'm one. <laughs> so things like that, how can we be a little bit more, sneaky has maybe a negative connotation, though I don't know, maybe the Department of Defense would, <laughs> would define it differently, resourceful, cunning. Um, so who we can partner with who aren't under the data governance program but can enable us and one of the things that we talked about amongst ourselves quite a bit was how the unfortunate situation of this pandemic has made clear a lot of the process inefficiencies. It's so easy for somebody to forward an email change and say, plus Kiyomi, well now it's my problem. They wouldn't have taken 20 minutes in the hallway to catch me up. So you can really kind of reframe that situation and come up with these little focus groups. You have every name in that email. You know who needs to fix the process and that can help give you your backlog for some of these little wins that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, yes, David. Thanks. Um, I've been coming to these for... Why don't you, I tell you what, since you're right up yeah, front, yeah. why don't you turn around? I've been coming to these free uh, uh, data diversity events for, I don't know, 10, 12 years now. And one of the things that's always very interesting to me is to see gradual long-term shifts in what topics or people are getting excited about. And... Uh, even though we've been away for a couple years, I've been doing events online, and quite suddenly here, what I was seeing was a big interest all of a sudden in data strategy and data management strategy, which I think is very important because it begins to reflect uh, a level of formal engagement with executive business leaders in driving the whole uh, data governance, data management function. And the other piece that's been coming up a lot, I work in financial services, so there's been a lot of conversation about ethical conduct over the years. But uh, another big thing that is, uh, quite frankly, the financial services industry is lagging a bit in this, but the question of data ethics. What constitutes uh, ethical access of data? What constitutes ethical usage of data? It's very nice to me to start seeing um, you know, talks on data ethics in this uh, particular conference. 
Good, yeah. I mean, that's a topic we've been tracking for so long, and we, we ran some sessions four or five years ago, and you know, literally had a handful of people attending them, but now uh, there's clearly a great deal more, more emphasis. And I think it comes from more than just the AI ethics. You know, everybody's heard about how algorithms gone bad can, uh, can be so detrimental, but um, I think just much more generally um, ethics has, has risen uh, on, the, on the priority list. Okay. Um, so is there anything particular that any of you plan to do differently, you know, when you get back to your desk? Me? Uh, I've got a whole list. Any, any, I'll, I'll let any of the three of you answer that. Yeah, I've got, I've got a whole list of things. Um, where I'm currently at with radio systems is getting the message out, kind of growing my posse, growing the interest, make it exciting. So I've been looking for tips and hints on how to make data fun. Um, how we can start gamifying, how we can earn badges, uh, uh, you know, how I can get my communications across in a fun manner. Mm -hmm. I, mean, yeah. I would uh, double down on communication. So I have invested some time in communications. I think I have a, a good start, but you know, the two minute um, data, uh, I forget the exact term that they use, the, the, what I have most of what I've done today in communications are, are big blocks of things, right? Big blocks. More frequent, uh, smaller, exactly smaller tidbits. Uh, that certainly resonates, especially, I was making this point a little bit ago, uh, when my audience is really has their own day job, the people who I want to change their hearts and minds, they have their own day job and they only have slices of attention to give to me on this subject, more smaller bits of information are certainly one of the things that I think I'll lean into. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll kind of echo a comment that was made in the back. I think that um, these sessions, the ones that I've participated in are largely confirming that we're on the right track with what we're doing within my company from a data governance structure, from a process perspective, from a from a metadata management data catalog perspective and from a data quality perspective. So I, I got some additional reinforcement that we're on the right track. Um, so I don't have like some big aha moment that I've captured this far, but what I plan on doing, because there's a lot of good content that comes out from these sessions is when I have time, probably hopefully sometime next week, is going through all the presentations. And what I like to do is I like to create uh, a short-term list and a long-term list and if I go through presentations and I see something that sticks out that I can immediately act on, maybe something I haven't thought of or a next step I need to take on something, I put that in that short-term list. And then other things that are more uh, future thinking, things that I'm, I'm trying to think about like master data management and think more three, four, five years out. If there's ideas that I find valuable from any of the content from these sessions, I'll kind of put that in that long-term category. That way I've kind of fully digested. And then I go back through those notes and I figure out you know, what, what things I plan on doing differently. So for me, um, I generally get done with this conference and I feel like it's information overload. So I've got to kind of re-digest some things. Um, so that's the approach that I take to figure out what I need to do differently. Reflecting on, on Scott's session this morning. So I'm, I'm based in LA. Uh, got a couple of friends um, who are comedians, and you know they do a little stand up, or maybe they try and you know get a job on a sitcom. Um, and uh, listening to Scott this morning, I mean, we're all talking so much about communication. Everybody's like huge on this, but um, if if we could figure out how to make data governance funny, like constructively <laughs> amusing, um, it, it would be so effective in making the point. Mark, I, I, I know you're smiling under that mask there. <laughs> uh, Mark, a couple of years ago, wrote a song about data governance. Uh -huh. I don't know if you ever performed that to a different group than yeah, one, one. <laughs> uh, one person, probably your wife. Or... <laughs> 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 Just my heart. <laughs> but, um, 
Yeah, I, I, since we keep coming back to communication so often, I, I think um, quite seriously, okay, seriously, we need to be less serious about some of this stuff and at least make it a lot more fun. And so I'm gonna undertake when I get back to LA to talk to some people who write jokes, who, you know, tell stories that, that extract fun things out of, out of situations, whatever, and, and see what we could do to make this stuff resonate with people more effectively just by being fun. Yes? I'm gonna have to outsource that. <laughs> Pardon me? I'm gonna have to outsource that, get someone else to write my jokes. <laughs> oh, God, goodness, I couldn't do it, but uh, you know, there are people who can make fun out of anything. <laughs> Well, I have a recent success story about that, working with our executive team where I'm at now. And um, every data governance model has one of those lovely pyramids, and I happen to adore Bob's. And, um, and so I'm talking with our C-suite, and I said, you're not on this pyramid, you're above the pyramid. The pyramid was built to worship you. <laughs> <laughs> and they thought that was hilarious. So <laughs> yeah, it, it helps it resonate, and it helps it connect with the, with the target audience. Yeah, I mean, in general, like, like kind of a serious bunch. Um, and it's, a, it's obviously a serious topic, but um, we've got to change the dynamic somehow. And, you know, I'm, because I've seen the same conversations taking place for 10 years. And clearly, we, you know, some folks manage to get over the hump and, and um, most others struggle. So I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm thinking maybe there's another way. So we'll work on that. All right. Um, by the way, uh, th there's actually quite a large LinkedIn group for this conference um, that has almost zero participation. And somebody asked me um, just this morning, you know, can we have a discussion group to continue some of the conversations? So um, I, I think we'll, we'll uh, it, it languishes because we frankly haven't put much effort into it, you know, don't have many resources, et cetera. So, we haven't uh, tried to cultivate it. Um, if anybody would like to help us do that, um, I, I think we could carry on some of these conversations uh, very constructively through that venue and um, you know, maybe create some continuity to the, the conversation. All right, so whether we've discussed it here or not, I wanna ask you folks, what do you, what do you see as the big issues coming down the pike that are going to affect data governance. Um, I don't know if those are technologies like blockchain or if there are other, you know, seismic shifts. Um, but, you know, where is data governance going to get pulled in in future that, that we should be thinking about so that we can either future-proof the strategy or at least not be surprised when it arrives? So let's, let's go the other way this time. Kim, if you've got any thoughts on that. Maybe, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so we are getting exactly what we've been begging for. We need the business people to be tech savvy. If they were just more tech savvy, this would all be so much easier. Where I'm at, at Radio Systems, we are hiring tech savvy people. You come in, you get a Tableau, uh, you know, editor license. So now here we are, like, they're like, where's your data catalog, Kim? Uh, you know, who, you know, how do I connect this data? And it's so, the, the issue I'm having, it's a good issue to have. It's exactly what we wanted to have happen, but like now we're scrambling. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this lights a fire under funding for things like data governance, like people get hired in, like how do you expect me to do my job when you don't have a data catalog? I'm supposed to talk to the IT department to figure out where my data is? I'm not doing that. So we're getting exactly what we wanted. So this is uh, careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's here now. <laughs> Um, I'll off, excuse me, I'll offer a rather niche issue in, in um, research and development in the pharma industry. There's new 
types of data, a, a lot of different types of data that are coming on the scene, things like uh, genomics, which kind of blur the line. Like you, you, you talk about privacy data, uh, for example, they, it, it, in genomics, you know, almost by definition, the data is only referring to you, but can you actually um, point back to me without some other source, like combining with the 23andMe or some of the online services? Um, it's, it's big, it's different, it is very personal. Uh, does that mean we need different rules, different styles, right? It's, it's very healthcare oriented, but that's an example of uh, new types of data that are gonna require um, different rules, still structurally the same. It's still a, a governance problem, a privacy problem, still the same kind of rules, but it is different, and I don't think we've netted out on how to, how to manage that yet. So rather industry specific problem, but that's something that's coming down the pike for us. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the trend that I'm seeing is I'm seeing data governance merge closer and closer to the business. And I've, I've heard it this week several times, but challenges with engagement. Um, I think when a data governance program originates somewhere within the IT and then you try to get all these stewards engaged and involved, it's very challenging. Um, I, I think more and more that our, our business cases for either data management or data governance initiatives are gonna to have to tie to the company's overall business strategic initiatives. And usually that is, you know, how can data governance or data management contribute to sales growth? How can it contribute to cost reduction? How can it contribute to, towards building your company's brand or providing better customer service? Um, I'm, I'm seeing personally more and more, the more I can connect what I'm doing to those business outcomes, the more people that are gonna to wanna to come with me on the journey. Mm -hmm. um, just to follow up on what Hayes was saying about different, different types of data. Um, quick show of hands, how many folks are, are involved in governing um, external data? Okay, uh, unstructured data, quite a few, okay, a lot more. Um, how many folks here uh, for how many folks here is um, privacy part of your general portfolio? Okay, yeah, that one has come along such a, a long way in just a couple of years. Um, all right, we get, we get you know, speaking proposals on these things and uh, I, I don't have a good way of measuring all the time uh, the level to which people are, are interested in the topics, but... Um, all right. Uh, what about you folks? What do you what do you see coming along that you're thinking is going to be relevant to you in future? All right, a couple of hands there. Uh, we'll take the gentleman on the right first, and then, yeah. Yes, you sir. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a double punch of an increased regulatory environment around privacy, and also with the proliferation of state and non-state actors when it comes to uh, holding ran, you know, ransomware attacks and companies need to have a better sense of where their data assets are and making sure that this enterprise asset is governed, protected, available, and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me add quickly to my prior questions. How many of you are um, involved uh, in, in more than just a peripheral way in uh, data security issues? Okay, thanks, relatively, relatively few compared to the others. All right, um, sir, yes, Dave's gonna bring you the, the microphone there. So I don't think it's really broad. I think it's really um, maybe niche, but really polarizing is the vaccine um, uh, passport or something along those nature. I mean, we did it here, right? We. We all had the validation process, and it's it's not there's no official um, entity that's signed up to do that in America. They're doing it in Europe and things. And um, I mean, it's not really broad, right? How many attributes would that be? But it's really polarizing. So I, I could see that really blowing up for a certain space. Yeah. Um, so as you might imagine, I've 
been paying a lot of attention to COVID issues over the past year and a half. And um, uh, it, was, it was really quite difficult to find the right tool to use to bring everybody back here. Um, we settled on clear after for uh, US attendees. So it, that, it only covers US, unfortunately. Um, we had to do different things for our international folks. Um, then um, uh, they had, they had uh, told us that we could track the folks who had uh, signed up and got pre-clearance, but what they didn't tell us, uh, or what they neglected to mention was the timing of that capability, which was not going to be until, I think, February of next year. So um, that's why we bombarded you with extra email messages to try to find out who had, who had been registered. Um, who had been cleared. But uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think at this point, it, it looks pretty likely that there's gonna be a lot of things that require vaccination. In LA, you have to have a vaccination uh, proof to eat indoors now. Um, you can eat outside without that, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's more and more pervasive. Um, how many folks here are familiar with uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs? <laughs> okay. Uh, I sh uh, you know, probably, uh, how many are familiar is probably the wrong way to phrase that question. Um, but I was reading an article recently about the application of NFTs essentially to, to data quality issues and, and assurance issues um, in an enterprise context. I mean, there's the whole crypto NFT uh, thing where people are selling digital assets for you know millions of dollars, but then it seems to me there's another application of NFTs in uh, providing ways for there to be information integrity and and digital assurances of various sorts. Have have any of you had any exposures to to have an opinion on that? At uh, the state of Tennessee, it was a non-funded program. Um, but, and I typically do this everywhere I work, you, you have to glom on to those inter, uh, enterprise initiatives. So the example I have at Tennessee, we needed to share large volumes of data with an external vendor. And they're like, well, we could put it in Dropbox, or we could SFTP it, or we could blah, and I'm like, why don't we drop it in Snowflake, and they'll just come get it. And the vendor's like, yeah, that's super easy for us. So we got our lake, you know, and so I kind of look for those opportunities to uh, tag along to everyone else's spending patterns. Mm -hmm. This is not, it is a story that happened in my company. It wasn't my project uh, especially, but it was around the blockchain idea and some of the, um, the contracts you can, you can make in blockchain. And the way they use it, I thought was pretty clever. Uh, in... Um, you have kind of a triumvirate of the patient, the, uh, the sponsor like Daichi Sankyo, and uh, the provider, the hospital. And you want to recruit patients to get into clinical studies, but the patients don't want to reveal too much information. And the hospitals, like they don't want to commit themselves. So they use con um, the, this concept of uh, contract and blockchain to be able to uh, uh, essentially let the patients reveal enough information that if the, if the hospital and the sponsor all met the right amount of information, the contact would be made so that their information, the patient's information especially, wasn't ever disclosed until there was enough information or enough criteria met to be able to make that, uh, that connection. And that helped kind of preserve privacy, pr preserve uh, make that connection in a way that preserved everybody's interest at the same time. Still prototype, uh, it was more than prototype, um, but not scaled yet. But I thought that was a, a really interesting idea around the blockchain area. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the company I work at, we don't have any, any specific use cases, but we do have a, a department that is specifically focused on innovation that is looking at pretty much any emerging technology that you can think of. And they go and they um, they'll do proof of concepts, and they'll they'll partner with vendors to try things out. So we don't have a specific one yet, but I mean, it is something we've we've looked at since it is an emerging tech. Yeah, for those of you who raised your hands and are familiar with NFTs, um, 
Any, any opinions on whether there are applications within an enterprise around data governance? No? Okay. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to track that one myself too because I have a personal interest in it. Um, let me invite any of you to, to throw in a question here. Um, what, do you, what thoughts do you have at the moment? Uh, unanswered questions? Yes, right in the middle. Since I deal in the financial industry, there is a lot of activity happening around um, bringing on other vendors coming in and wanting access to our data, et cetera. Has DGIO ever thought about having any type of sessions around contractual type of things that you need to put in protections for data so that your quality of data, your security of your data, all that type of things is contractually working with your vendors that way? Because mm -hmm. everywhere you go, you kind of hear some certain clauses that you should have in your contracts, certain clauses that you shouldn't have in your contracts. And I, I know some guidance around that. Even our legal teams are just kind of like, data is kind of new to their world as well. And so it'd be kind of interesting to see if there was something around that. Yeah. Um, so often at uh, this conference, we've had uh, a lawyer by the name of Bill Tenenbaum, who, who specializes actually in issues specifically uh, like the one that you mentioned. Um, I'll dig up some of his prior material for you and we can share that. Um, it, but uh, the, the latest there is probably a couple of years old. Um, I can check in with Bill and see what he's been doing recently because I imagine that that area of the law has probably changed substantially since then. You're particularly interested in the question from a contracting standpoint? No, it just says data officers, what should we be kind of looking for as we're reviewing those contracts, kind of give us some lessons learned and or some tips in regards to ensuring that you're not doing a certain thing or you're doing something that you need for them. Okay. Especially as we start going to a fabric or or we're getting into data lakes where potential can be exposed to vendors so that they can come in and get that information or you're putting it somewhere where they're getting to it, what they do with it, how they handle it. Because in like in our case, the data that they're wanting to see is our customer base. So we have to be protective, legally, regulatory, to ensure that the privacy is kept on that, that information and that the security is kept on that information. Yep. And so our contracts are better like that. So you got the legal issue, you got the compliance issue, you got the data issue, and the CEOs kind of have to look at all that. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, I can add a little, a little bit to that. Um, we have a, a data classification policy within our organization that's that's focused on classifying data by its sensitivity. So. Data can either be restricted or sensitive or non-sensitive or public. Those are our four categories. And what we've done is uh, we're an insurance, so we, we deal with a lot of sensitive data like PII and PHI and such. And what we've done is we've kind of mapped our classification to our, our data agreements. So if a, if a given third party is dealing with all public data, maybe they don't need to sign any additional agreements. If they're dealing with PII, then there's an additional agreement they'll need to sign. If they're dealing with PHI, there's an additional agreement. So we try to tie access and our contracts with the corresponding um, sensitivity classification of our data, and we found that pretty helpful. Okay. Uh, I think there's another question. Yes, Sarah. Hi. Uh, so I'm in biotech, and I've recently been asked about uh, governing markings. So we have different markings, uh, whether it's a CE mark, whether it's like identifying hazardous material, um, but these aren't really, it's not data I'd previously ever governed. And so I don't know if anyone, has anyone come across any of those types of things or gotten questions about governing that kind of data? You were in bio, hey, you know? Yeah, I don't have that one. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -uh. Um, I'm. Is does markings have a specific? Yeah, they are. Uh, so, so for example, the CE mark is to identify this is product to be sold in Europe. Um, there's oh. also different like um, hazardous markings to explain whether you have like maybe lithium batteries. Um, but there's all sorts of markings that appear on labels, 
and they're getting more and more complex and they're becoming more specific to each country. For some mm -hmm. odd reason, they don't seem to all have alignment on the markings. But, um, but it came to me and I just was like, you know, for my regulatory group, and I just didn't have an answer. I was, I was curious if anyone else had, had uh, experienced that. Okay. Sorry we don't have a good answer for you on that one. Um, anybody else have questions before we, we wind up? All right. Well, uh, most of you will be here over the next couple of days, I know, so uh, please keep the conversations going. Uh, at this point, we can wrap up the, the formal uh, conference portion of our agenda. Uh, and I'll say again, it's been wonderful to have you all back. I hope the next couple of days are productive for you too and that we see you at an event in 2022. So thank you.